We are continuing today in our series in 2 Samuel uh, after a short break. Uh, and believe it or not, maybe this is, you know, a happy day or happy news I'm about to give you or not, but we're four sermons left in our series, including today. And in today's passage, we have what is a familiar sight in the book of Samuel, right? War between the Philistines and Israel. But we actually haven't seen the Philistines in quite a while when you think about it. We have to go back to chapter 8 of 2 Samuel to see the last battle between Israel and the Philistines. If you remember back to that incident, we saw David was able to do what Saul was unable to do. As the true king, he was able to defeat the Philistines, to defeat the great enemy of God's people once and for all. Chapter 8 details all of David's victories after he becomes king against all the nations in and around Israel, and it begins with this. After this, David defeated the Philistines and subdued them. And David took Methegamah out of the hands of the Philistines. And at that time, if you remember, I said, well, at this point, the Philistines ceased to be the thorn in the side of Israel they had been for so long. They're never again the power they once were. And for much of David's reign, we never hear them even mentioned until now. See, the same old troubles came back again. The Philistines were defeated. They're not the problem they used to be, but they're still a problem when they, when they show up. And here, near the very end of David's reign, they show up. But it's not a prolonged war that we read about here, but four isolated battles that center on four specific Philistines and four specific Israelites. So this isn't the grand army of the Philistines we were used to in 1 Samuel, with all that military might that even defeated Israel at times. This is just a small remnant of Philistines. The small amount of Philistines still dwelling in the land of Judah. So, we have here an enemy that's been defeated, and yet an enemy that still exists within the land among God's people. And because they're there, they can still cause trouble for God's people. Again, not an all-out war, but it means occasional skirmishes that arise from time to time. Although it might seem odd to call an enemy defeated in one breath, and then the next breath talk about the battles they're still fighting. You know, I think we can relate to this, can't we? I think it's more relevant to us here than we think at first glance, because this describes exactly the position we are all in right now as God's people, right? There are enemies that have been defeated. We've been speaking about them the last two weeks in our Easter series. Through all that Christ has done, our enemies have been defeated. Sin has been defeated. Once and for all, sin has been defeated. Christ took on our sin. And he carried his cross and he died so the wage of sin could be paid for us. So we could be set free from the power of sin. And he didn't stop. He rose again. He ascended to heaven and sent his spirit through whom now God works out in real time the power of God through us. So we can live dead to sin and alive unto him. And yet, though defeated once and for all, though truly disarmed of, of all of its power, Sin still pops up from time to time, doesn't it? We still battle against it, even though it's been defeated. And battle it, we must. Because like the Philistines, still dwelling in Israel, sin, though defeated by Christ, it still dwells within us. This is the reality of living in a corrupted creation. Even though we have been made new, there is still indwelling sin. So we have to fight the battle. It was more, when Christ went to the cross, he defeated Satan. He defeated all the powers of darkness. Right? They thought they had won. Just like remember when the Philistines defeated Israel and took the ark, they thought they had won. God showed them who the true victor was, right? So too, the powers of darkness, they learned at the cross. What they briefly thought was their greatest victory, no, they learned it was their great defeat. Christ disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in the cross. And he's given us authority over the powers of darkness. And as Brother Chris said this morning, he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. Amen? Amen? And yet, though defeated once and for all, though disarmed of their power over us, the powers of darkness still battle us. They've been defeated. But they still pop up, fighting a war against us, against the church. And you know what? We have to battle when that happens. And this is the reality of living in a world that we are not of. Satan has domain over those in the world. And when the kingdom of God encroaches on what he thinks is his territory, you know what? He fights. So we still have to fight. We have to fight battles against a defeated enemy. 
But how do we fight? What, what is our weapon against these enemies, sin, and the powers of darkness that are actually already defeated? Well, let's find out in our passage today. Let's look at battle number one. We read there was war again between the Philistines and Israel. And David went down together with his servants, and they fought against the Philistines. And David grew weary. And Ishbi Benab, one of the descendants of the giants, whose spear weighed 300 shekels of bronze, and was armed with a new sword, thought to kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, came to his aid and attacked the Philistine and killed him. Then David's men swore to him, You shall no longer go out with us to battle, lest you quench the lamp of Israel. We actually have two subplots meeting up here. First, we have the battle itself, right? We are told there was battle again, there was war again between the Philistines and Israel. There was war again. Like, I read this and I can imagine a narrator's voice. There was war again. Because how many times have we seen this? How many times has there been war between Israel and the Philistines? Well, I counted 20 up to this point. We read of 18 separate engagements between the armies of Israel and the Philistines in 1 Samuel and two in 2 Samuel so far. And that culminated with their defeat in 2 Samuel chapter 8 that we just read about. And that's not even considering the book of Judges, where, where this, this war was already raging. You know, in 1 Samuel, more ink was used to write of the wars between Israel and the Philistines than was used to describe the conflict between David and Saul. I mean, the writer had something in mind here. He wanted to make sure the existence of this enemy was known. He focused on it. He wanted there to be no mistakes, no misunderstandings. The enemy that dwelt within Israel's own borders was a great threat to God's people. Until, that is, God anointed a king. He anointed a king to be victorious over these enemies, to win victory over them once and for all. And even though the enemy, as we see, was still there and would still try to cause trouble, they were defeated. Well, this is just what happened to us, Right? This is what God's anointed king, Jesus Christ, did for us through his finished work. As we read in Ephesians 2, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying up desires of the body and of the minds, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We were dead. We were dead in sin. We were the walking dead because we were walking in sin. In other words, we were losing the war. We were going to be defeated. We were following the powers of darkness. We were following the powers of darkness, and we were under God's wrath for it. And you know what? We were stuck there. We had already lost that war. But God. God anointed a king who won victory over both sin and the powers of darkness. And when he was raised, we're told we were raised with him over the powers of darkness, over the enticements of this world, over the power of sin. Because the Bible's pretty clear. From Genesis 3 on, there is an enemy. There is an enemy in this world that wants to devour us like a lion devours its prey. There is an enemy that now knows that he has lost and will strike wherever, whenever, and however he can to take down as many as he can before the end. But what's more is an enemy within. The enemy that used to have us under its power. We were servants of sin. Servants of sin and headed for wrath. You know why? We served sin and we liked it. We didn't want to not serve sin. You know, there's more ink used in the Bible to talk about the reality of sin and the judgment it deserves than there is about God's love. Much more. This is an enemy that the Holy Spirit wants to make sure is front and center in the Bible. The enemy that is the greatest danger to man because it's an enemy that is part of who we are. An enemy that literally dwells within us. Just like the Philistines dwelt in the physical order, borders of Israel, sin dwells within us. But God, thank God he did what we couldn't do. 
Thank God he sent the king to come to the front lines to take down our enemies through his own suffering and death. Thank God he raised him on the third day that we might know the enemy has been defeated. Thank God that he raised him back to his throne in the heavenly places over all rule and authority and has raised us with him. Thank God that he has sent his spirit, that he has placed within us the one greater than sin, the one greater than Satan, the one more powerful than anything else. And this is why David in the books of Samuel point us forward to Christ, the anointed king, that God says to defeat the enemies of his people. And we read that, David defeated them. But here we are. And the battle isn't over. All right, that's the first subplot going on here. But second, we have this brief narrative about David. You know, that young shepherd warrior who once stepped up to the front line. Remember him? When no one else in Israel wanted to, when no one else in Israel could, he stepped up to fight the battle for God's people and he was victorious. Now, now David, near the end of his life, we read there was war again between the Philistines and Israel, and David went down together with his servants and they fought against the Philistines. And David grew weary. Then David's men swore to him, you shall no longer go out with us to battle lest you quench the lamp of Israel. So while the books of Samuel will continually point us to Christ through David, they also continually remind us David's just a pointer to Christ. David is a weak man. He fails. He falls to sin over and over again. Here he's too old and weak to continue fighting. This was David's final battle. And while there's no parallel between David and Christ when it comes to this sin, there is one, one more important fact we see here. That once the king defeats the enemy, now it's for his people to continue fighting the battle. Right? David defeated the Philistines. They're defeated. But there's still battles to be fought. And it won't be the king who fights them. He did what he needed to do for God's people. Now it was their turn to fight the battle. And you know what? They could. Because the king had already won victory. They could have victory because the king won victory. You know, near the end of 2 Samuel, a couple chapters from now, there are 31 verses dedicated just to listing the mighty men of David's army. And don't worry, we're not going to go over that portion. But there's a reason that list is there. You know, the writer wants to show us there were people in the kingdom that were ready and able to defeat the enemy. There were people in the kingdom that were ready to do great things because of their faith and because of their loyalty to their king. And that's exactly what we're called to do. We are called to have that kind of faith. We are called to be loyal to our king and fight the battles that need to be fought until the king returns victorious. And because of what our king has done, we can defeat the enemy when it comes against us in battle. We can have victory because Christ, our king, has already won the victory. He did all that needed doing to free us from the power of sin. Right? Remember, he took us who were dead in sin and made us alive unto him. Now we're not dead in sin, but dead to sin. So you know what? That's an enemy we can fight. That's an enemy that we can beat. Because it's an already defeated enemy. Christ defeated the powers of darkness. Right? He took us who followed the prince, the power of the air, made us alive with Christ and raised us over the powers of darkness. Now we can defeat that enemy. It's an already defeated enemy. David wasn't going to fight anymore. The king did his work. Now the king's people had to do the work. Christ has already won. We got to do the work now. You know, the problem is I, I think... I think to a point we've also come to this modern American Christianity that's very individualistic, very consumer-based, uh, right? That's our culture. It's been for 100 years now. And so we say, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian, but it's, it's a relationship, not a religion. And we talk about our personal relationship with Christ, like, hey, what I do is only between me and Christ and nobody else. Not what the Bible says. But these ideas have, have infiltrated the church, and we bought in to an extent, so we go to church because it helps me grow closer to God. And I take part in those activities that really appeal to me. Uh, you know, I get something out of these. I enjoy them, and, and I make sure to do my personal devotions and strive for personal holiness. And, and none of that stuff is bad. 
It's actually all necessary, but those are means to an end. They're means to an end. Because we are a kingdom at war. They had to prepare us for the battle. What we do as Christians, for the most part, is kind of like signing up to become a Navy SEAL, right? And we go through this, like, this toughest training in the world, become some of the greatest soldiers in the world, then it's time to deploy, and we say, nah, I just wanted to be a Navy SEAL, thanks. Imagine if that's what happened. Just making soldiers as an end, not a means of defending our people, not a means of winning victory. So we take means and make them ends, and the result is everything we complain about in American Christianity. But we're in a battle. Christ has already won the victory for us. But there is still territory to reclaim for our king. There is still people to be brought into the kingdom. And there's an enemy that is defeated but still battling. And brothers and sisters, we, look, especially a church like Montclair Community Church, we need to get in the battle. Like the battles we see being fought here. Again, an Ishbi Benab, one of the descendants of the giants, whose spear weighed 300 shekels of bronze and who was armed with a new sword, thought to kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, came to his aid and attacked the Philistine and killed him. So we have a descendant of the giants whose spear weighed 300 shekels and who has a new sword, and he's coming for David. Now, why would these details be given? Well, because this imagery is supposed to bring back to mind the battle of David and Goliath, right? And we already know what the true king did in that case. He's the one who stepped up to do what nobody else could do, and he defeated the enemy. And here we have these descriptions, like the weight of a spear, which is actually only half of what Goliath's spear was, because, you know, the enemy was defeated and doesn't have the power he once did. We're told he had a new sword. Anybody remember anything about Goliath's sword? Oh, don't no, remind you. We're told David goes into battle with no sword, just a sling and the stone. He faces off against Goliath. David hits him in the forehead. Goliath falls down on his face, but he's not dead. And then we read this. There was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And this is, of course, a picture of what Christ did at the cross. Right? Paul tells us that the powers of darkness to put Christ on the cross. But it was Christ on the cross that proved to be the defeat of those powers, right? The enemy took Christ, the meek and gentle Christ, who, who didn't speak up in his own defense, who went like, like a sheep led to the slaughter. And what they thought was their greatest weapon wound up being used to cut off their own head. What they thought was going to bring them victory was used for their defeat. And like David did with the sword of Goliath, here we have a powerful enemy with this new sword. And Ishbi Benab, one of the descendants of the giants, whose spear weighed 300 shekels of bronze and was armed with a new sword, sword, thought to kill David. Goliath came against David with a sword. Here comes this giant with a sword. But it's a new sword, right? Like, okay, this isn't Goliath's sword, this is my sword. It's a new sword. I'll get this right. I'm, I'm coming for David now. It's going to be different this time. See, the powers of darkness are shrewd. Right? They're always coming up with new ways to try and deceive people, to destroy the souls of men by leading them astray and away from God. But the fact of the matter is that a sword is a sword. So I'm going to tell you what the reality is. The powers of darkness don't have any new tactics. They have one weapon. Lies. There might be new lies. The lies that fool me might not be the lies that fool you. But a sword is a sword. And when those powers come against us, when they speak deceit into the world around us, what are we supposed to do? We do what our king did, like Abishai did. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, came to his aid and attacked the Philistine and killed him. Abishai pulled to David. He stepped up, went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the giant, fought the battle, and the enemy was defeated. You know, Satan came against our Lord the first time, right? Tried to use... Deceit, to disqualify him from his ministry like he does to us. And we read about those temptations at the outset of Jesus' ministry. And what does Jesus do? Very simply, he chose to believe God's word over Satan's word. It's all he had to do to win that battle. Satan tried to deceive him three different times, and three different times Jesus chose to believe the word of God. Stood firm in the truth. So if we want to win battles, 
against the enemy and against the deceit. We know what we got to do. We just got to know and believe God's word. Then they can't fool us. Satan came against our Lord for a last time. Right? He used deceit to use the people around Jesus to send him to the cross. And what did Jesus do? He took up his cross and he denied himself. And he fulfilled his calling even though it meant suffering and death. And Jesus says to us all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So we want to win these battles against the powers of darkness, against the indwelling sin. We know what we have to do. We have to deny ourselves. We have to take up our cross and we have to follow Jesus daily, again and again and again. Because there will be battles to fight again and again. Verse 18, after this there was again war with the Philistines at Gob. Then Sibachai the Hushathite struck down Saph, who was one of the descendants of the giants. There's war again. One of the giants again. I guess one of David's men again. See, in this life, these battles aren't going to end. They're just not. So we need to choose to believe God over and over again. We have to choose to deny ourselves and take up our cross daily and follow Christ no matter what it means again and again and again. Because the enemy keeps coming. Verse 19, and there was again war with the Philistines at Gob. And Elhan Elhanan, the son of Jair Oregim, the Bethlehemite, struck down Goliath the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. I can't wait to get back to the New Testament. It's John, Paul, this is... <laughs> Here, we have this Bethlehemite said to strike down Goliath. And this on its own seems like a mistake, doesn't it? Because Goliath's already dead. I'm going to take us to the First Chronicles account, where I think the real reading is preserved. First Chronicles 20, and there was again war with the Philistines, and El Elhanan, the son of Jair, struck down Lami, the brother of Goliath the Gittite, a shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. So it's Goliath's brother this man fought. But that's not the point. The point is history keeps repeating itself. The war is won. There are battles that are won. But the enemy doesn't give up. The enemy's been defeated. And he can be defeated over and over again, but he's not going to give up. Verse 20, there was, again, war at Gath, where there was a man of great stature who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in number. And he also was the center from the giants. And when he taunted Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimei, David's brother, struck him down. All right, we get it, right? You want to say to the author, dude, like, it's getting redundant at this point. Why are you saying the same exact thing over and over and over again? Why do we need to read about these battles over and over and over again? Well, why are we tempted with the same sins over and over and over again? Why do we have the same vulnerabilities to the deceit of the enemy over and over and over again? He said, the devil has no new tricks. But if we're honest, he doesn't need any, does he? Our hearts do most of the work for him. If you, struggle, if you struggle with anger, the powers of darkness don't try to tempt you with lust. No, they try to tempt you with anger. If your weak spot is gossip, the powers of darkness aren't going to try to make you angry. They're going to deceive people around you to come up to you and start gossiping. It's our own propensity towards certain sins that do most of the work. Powers of darkness need a little, little nudge. And they pop up and fight the only way they know how. Sword is a sword. So how do we fight back? Well, before we can answer that, I just want us to notice a few more things about this passage. First, we get a summary of the events here with this last verse, verse 22. These four were descended from the giants in Gath, and they fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. Two important things to notice here. So we had that refrain with every battle. There was war again. But there's another refrain in each battle. Every one of these Philistines is said to be descended from the giants, descended from the Rapha, or in the plural, the Rephaim. And while it would take way too long to go through every verse and show this, the Rephaim basically are giants, descendants of the Nephilim. And you know, if you look at the very first battle recorded in the Bible, it involves the Rephaim. If you look at the kings that Israel battled before they got to the promised land, like Og, king of Bashan, 
the Ref Rephaim. Remember the failures of Saul that lost him the kingdom, right? That was over battles with the Anakim, who were called Rephaim. Goliath of Gath, if you remember, was Rephaim. And here these giants are Rephaim. Why does that matter? Well, as I said, the, the Rephaim are descendants of the Nephilim, who are the Nephilim. The Nephilim are hybrid offspring of human women and rebellious heavenly beings. But the Nephilim are the result of spiritual rebellion by spiritual beings. And the reason God has Israel war against certain societies and wipe them out is because it's judgment for this rebellion. All what to say, these battles of the giants, these four battles that look exactly the same here that we see, this isn't just physical warfare. This is spiritual warfare. These battles with the giants that the king's people had to fight over and over and over again, they're spiritual battles. And that's what our battle is. I know in, in, in popular Christian culture, we like to talk about slaying our giants, right? And when we say that, we mean, you know, we're going to overcome some opposition. We're going to overcome great odds. Maybe even personal problems or specific challenges. Sometimes they're even like character flaws. I'm going to, I'm going to knock this giant down. No. These giants represent, as Richard Phillips says in his commentary, the grotesque reign of satanic evil, our spiritual enemy. What we see is that it took people of faith, people who are loyal to their king no matter what, to win these spiritual battles. To again have victory over the already defeated enemy. These were people who were willing to deny themselves and take up their cross and follow their king. But I want us to notice something else here. It says these four giants, spiritual enemies of God's people, they fell by the hand of who? This doesn't list the men again. It doesn't say, oh, it was these men, because they were mighty. No, these spiritual enemies fell by the hand, it says, of David and by the hand of his servants, by the king and his people. But wait, a few verses back, we just saw David didn't defeat any of them. He got tired. Abishai had to come to his defense and defeat the enemy. When did David defeat these enemies? When he did what the only true king could when he defeated them once and for all when he was crowned king. Again, what we read in chapter 8. After this, David defeated the Philistines and subdued them, and David took Methegamah out of the hands of the Philistines. After this, after what? Remember what 2 Samuel 7 is? It's God's covenant with David. It's when God promises to the king, the true king that will come. It's when God promises David that he will be the one who defeats the enemies of God's people. It's when he promises the descendant of David that will reign forever and ever. And right after this, by faith, because David believed the word of God, even though it hadn't yet been fulfilled, by faith, David goes and defeats the enemies of God. And we see in our passage today, because the king defeated these enemies once and for all, when they try to raise back up and they come against God's people, God's people can have victory. David and his men did this. Because of what David had done, his people could do what they did. Because the king had won victory, the people could win victory. Our king has won victory. Brothers and sisters, we can have victory. We can have victory over the defeated enemies of sin, over the, the rulers and authorities and cosmic powers over this present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And you know what? It will be Christ who does it through us. It's still his battle. And it's like David has said to have won these battles, he will win the battle. If we have faith, and if we're loyal to our king. And this isn't like faith in the abstract. You know, that kind of heart thing that you feel that's really hard to describe. No. It's about exercising very real faith. Doing what Christ did when we faced the enemy. Choosing to believe God's word over the lies of the enemy. That's how we exercise faith. When the enemy wants to fool us and destroy him, we have to choose to remember what God says. When temptations to sin come, you know, those things that we want to convince ourselves at the time aren't really sin, we, we got to believe God's word over our own. We need to take up our cross. 
and deny ourselves. That may mean, and probably does, we have to deny some things in our lives that we don't want to. I'm going to talk about sinful things. We have to deny things, people, activities that tend to lead us towards sin. We have to deny things that the world says and sometimes convinces us that's absolutely fine. Now, what does God say? We have to believe it by denying ourselves what the enemy wants us to have. And though that's very simple to understand, it's not so easy, is it? I get that. <laughs> I probably get it more than most, man. My faith is no greater than yours, trust me. But Christ said even faith the size of a mustard seed is enough to move mountains. And the mountains Jesus is talking about there, that is the kingdom of the enemy. When we have faith and we know the word and we choose to believe the word and we choose to live out the word, even in the smallest decisions, you know what happens? The enemy loses ground and Christ wins another battle. Every time we choose to obey and turn our backs on sin, Christ is victorious and we've won another battle. And you don't need to be some super spiritual mega Christian to do this. You know why? It is the same Christ that works through all of us. It's not our faith, big or small. It is the object of our faith. He will do the work. Amen. And we see here we have four different Israelites, victorious because they had faith. Abishai, Sibachai, Elhanan. Those are three mighty men. They're in the list. They were exceptional warriors. So we may look at this and say, Liam, I'm no mighty man of faith. Well, join the club. But then we have Jonathan. David's nephew. He's not listed among the mighty men. In fact, we haven't heard about him before. In 2 Samuel, we don't hear about him again. He's just part of the kingdom who has faith and loyalty to his king. See, it's not just the spiritual giants that are called to fight the battle. It's everyone in the kingdom. And the king won victory for him. And then the king won victory through him. And that's what Christ will do for us. So that means if we're going to go into battle, we need him. See, this is why we need to hear the gospel over and over and over again. Because the enemy is going to come over and over and over again. Sin, our own hearts, is going to tempt us over and over and over again. But armed with the sword of a spirit, which is the word of God, believing the truth of God, we can prevail against temptation. We can have victory over sin. And we can extinguish the flaming darts of the evil one. Amen? So all we can do is see Christ. He's our not-so-secret weapon. We see Christ today. We see Christ tomorrow. We see Christ again and again and again until our faith becomes sight and the enemy is defeated finally and forever and the battles all come to an end. So just consider this morning. How are you seeking Christ? We're called to deny ourselves, take up our cross daily and follow Christ. We're called to do it again and again. When we consider what the king did for us, how can we do any less? Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. 
and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. The knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises. So that through them, we may become partakers of a divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he's blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, Brothers and sisters, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fail. By grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let's remind ourselves of these things again and again and again. Let's remind each other of these things again and again and again. Let us not forget who we are, and let us not forget whose we are. And brothers and sisters, let's get into the battle. Let's assail the very gates of hell. Let's choose again and again to believe God, so that the world may know there is a Savior, and that victory has been won. And you know what? We are going to see giants fall by the hand of our King. We are going to see mountains moved by the hand of our King. And he's going to do it through us. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Good and gracious God, Lord. When we just sit and, and hear your word and the awesome truth of who you are and what you've done for us, Lord. That calling on our lives to take up our cross and deny ourselves and follow you. Lord, it, it doesn't seem so big a thing. In fact, it seems like it's the only thing we can do for one who has done so much for us. And yet, Lord, I know this world. And I know who has dominion over it. And I know my own heart, God. And I know the weakness that is in me. But Lord, you've granted us faith. Faith that even if it's as small as a mustard seed, Lord, is powerful. Powerful, God. More powerful than temptation. More powerful than the enemy. So Lord, help us. Help us to remember what you have said. Help us remember who you have said we are. Help us remember that you have said sin has no power over us. Help us to remember that you have said the enemy has no power over us. And Lord, work in us by your spirit that we may choose again and again and again to believe you, to live out what you say is truth, God. That we may show your light in the world, God. Reclaim territory from the enemy. God, I want to see souls saved. I want to see people brought from darkness into life. Yes. I want to see people who are dead in their sin be brought to life. Yes, Lord. So, God, we surrender to you this morning. Yes. Just take a hold of our hearts and work in us, God, because you have a purpose. You have a purpose, Lord, in all of it. So, God, we submit ourselves to your will, to your word. And, Lord, by faith, we will choose to believe you. So work that in us, Lord. Let your word take root in our hearts, Lord, in our minds. Let us always keep in mind whose we are. 
and the enemy will have no power over us. So we pray you would work this by your spirit. We pray it in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.